before we worship, I just want to, let's just bow our heads and worship in prayer to the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you are our living God, our strength, our defender, our helper. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who was given a name above all names. He is our redeemer, our restorer, the light of the world. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Just fill us and guide us into all truth and help us glorify the Lord. I thank you, God, that you have given us victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. I just decree a shift from bondage to liberty. I decree that we are shifting from oppression to glory. I hear the sound of marching troops of heaven, and I hear the sound of revival and awakening. Power from heaven is flowing to us and through us, Lord Jesus. Thank you. In Jesus' name, that all enemy resistance in the natural and the spiritual realms be shattered. The Lord Sabaoth, the Lord of angel armies, is on our side. We will win by the blood of the Lamb. When our eyes are on you, Jesus, when we open our mouth and we declare your goodness, God. Dear Father, I just ask that you be glorified in our worship this morning. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Stand together and let's worship the Lord. There is power.
sing in that God has no rival. Nothing can stand against the kingdom of heaven. Nothing. And because nothing can stand against God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that lives in you, you have no rival that you can't defeat yourself through Jesus Christ. Amen? I'm glad you're here today. I see my family. I see my brothers and my sisters here today. I see my family from across the street. I love you guys. If, if you guys, and he's not asking for this, but if you've seen the man that carries the cross from Boise to the Great Bend and around town, he's carried it in Houston, he's been out in California. This is Ken. He carries the cross to remind people that Jesus Christ is their Savior and what he did. Seventy some years old, Ken, is that right to tell him that? You're still carrying the cross. He's at eighty. So don't think that God's not done with you yet. Eighty years old and he's carrying the cross and he brings up a story and then people ask him why he does it and he witnesses to him. Jim, I want you to meet Ken before he leaves today. Ken, I want you to tell him your story about the movie you wrote. Ken inspires me, you guys. I, I see him carry the cross, and uh, people sometimes say nice things, and sometimes they don't. But that doesn't matter to Ken because his eyes are on the cross. And he believes that if he can just win one to Christ, it doesn't matter what the other ten think. It's the one that's saved through the story of the cross of Jesus Christ. Ken's wrote a wonderful script and a movie that's about six hours long, and I've read good parts of the script, and I tell you what, it's wonderful. Ken's a great writer. We are so blessed from the people that come into our lives, and we call them family and friends, and they have their own testimony to tell, and Ken is one of those guys that runs with me in Arlen and makes a true difference. What kind of difference are you making today? What kind of cross are you carrying? I'm here to tell you today that God wants to know more and more about you. What I'm saying is he's wanting to pull you into him. He's wanting to share his love with you. He's wanting to get intimate with you and tell you everything about himself. He showed his perfect love through his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Amen. Church is kind of quiet this morning. Amen. Amen. I just want to make sure you're not sleeping on me. And I was going to tell you guys a joke today about an umbrella, but I just figured it would go over your head. <laughs> God loves to laugh, does he not? I want to welcome all you who are watching on Facebook Live, and, and we just pray that God's going to touch your heart today. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we want to surround ourselves with your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from us, God. Send the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts today and our minds. Help us run the race that's right and fitting in your sight, God. Paul talked about running the race. And I pray, God, that if your people are hurting today, I pray, Father, that you take that pain from them, Lord. And I pray that you make yourself known to them in a way that they've never known you before. You're a God who loves. You're a God of peace. And I pray that over everyone that's here today, over our family that's watching today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As days go by, I get a lot of emails and texts and phone calls from people that are sick and hurting. And sometimes I just drop to my knees and say, God, mercy, I give. 
Our heart breaks for people when they're sick and you, you, you pray and you pray and you, you, you keep believing and you keep speaking and asking God, heal our land. Heal those people from their cancer. And I don't want us to, 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 to blame God for things today. If things are going on in your life today, it's, it's not God's fault. God's the answer, amen? God knows what's going on in your heart today. Troy doesn't, but God does. God knows if you're suffering pain some in your physical body. He knows in your spiritual body if, if you're suffering and you're lacking well, what I'm saying is, is that don't quit asking God to heal you. Don't quit asking God to build your marriage up. Carrie and I were talking about marriage yesterday, and I don't want to ever come across as a guy that's got it all together. If I don't tell you guys the truth, then I'm failing you. Do Carrie and I ever have arguments? Yes, we do. Does Troy fall short when it comes to his marriage? Yes, I do. But then I think of the one who doesn't fall short. His name is Jesus, and he lifts us up, and he makes everything new. And Carrie and I were having this great conversation, and, and we were building our marriage, and we were working on it. And the point is, it is if, if you're not adding and, and, and spending time in your marriage, you're, you're missing what God truly has for your life. If, if, if you're dating someone, your significant other, you want to spend extra time with them, and you, you want to get to know them, and it's all about building a, a relationship. Somehow we get so busy in life that our relationships go the opposite direction, and that's often what happens when it comes to Jesus. I can see it, it maybe next Sunday or Sunday after that I'm going to talk about marriage. God has really laid that on my heart. And I, I think this fall that we'll probably have some Bible studies in the evening on marriage. And on Tuesday nights, um, I'm working with Michelle Gwynn that we want to bring something called Freedom in Christ. Some of you already know about this by Neil Anderson. But it's going to take a commitment from the church. It's going to take up one of your evenings where maybe you don't watch a ball game. Or maybe you cut something out, but I promise you we'll have fun and it'll change your life forever. God wants to peel back the pains in your life. He wants to peel back the things that weigh you down and drag, drag you down. And he's going to use us to help get rid of those. But are you willing to take the first step? To come and see what God has in store for you and through the freedom of Christ. There's freedom in Christ if you seek after it with all you've got. I feel a weight in here this morning. I feel a weight that, that life is pulling people down in ways that, that God wouldn't have and God wouldn't allow, but the enemy is throwing them at you and the, the weight is almost to the point where you can't breathe. Maybe, maybe it's somebody listening, but God feels your weight today. God said, cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. God wants to set you free. Whatever you're holding on to, God says, give it to me, and I'll give you rest. I'll give you the peace and the assurance that you're seeking and looking after. That's our God. The title of today's sermon is Don't Let Your Mind Run Wild. Is anybody's mind ever all over the place? Every day? So I Googled this. I didn't come up with this. But supposedly somewhere around 70,000 thoughts cross our mind in a day. So let's just say it was 20,000 thoughts cross our mind in a day. That's a whole bunch. What in the world are we thinking about? No wonder we get depressed at times because I don't, I don't even know how our mind can compute things that fast, let alone. But you know what? 
Ooh, what your mind's thinking about and the wheels are just turning, your heart's taking it in. And what comes out of a man's mouth is in his heart and what it starts in your mind and what we think about goes to our heart. If we hate somebody and we're constantly thinking about that situation that they wronged us, it's going to your heart. Somehow we got to change our thought pattern. And Paul said to take every thought captive. Every single thought taken captive. So if there's 70,000 thoughts, if there's 20,000 thoughts, then that's a whole lot of captive. How in the world are we going to do that? Through remembering that Jesus Christ can set you free. Jesus wants to set your mind free today of the things of the world. And I, I just want you to, as I often say, sit here and relax. The air conditioner's on. When we're social distancing, we're good. There's nothing to worry about. For this little while, just take in some rest and some comfort and pray that you live in the spirit and not in the flesh. Allow the Holy Spirit to consume you and speak you. And whatever you brought with you today from the outside, let it go. The only conversation that matters, Tom Hanks said in that movie, Mr. Rogers, is the one that we're having right now. Right, Jim? You guys, Scripture says greater things will we do than even what Christ did. I keep asking God, when are we going to get to that point? God, I've seen some things, but you did all those already. And I know that what God meant was is there's greater things to come with his help. We're not going to do them without him. We're going to survive because of him. We're going to see healings and signs and wonders and miracles because Jesus' name prevailed. Peter said, gold or silver I do not have, but rise, get up and walk in the name of Jesus. That's yours if you believe it. Start speaking out healing out of your life. Start speaking healing over your mind. When you have a false thought, just tell the enemy to leave. Everything Satan tells you is a lie. Scripture says that if you knew what hour the enemy would come, you would have set up and watched at your house and stop the enemy from breaking in. Now that, that really doesn't have to do, maybe I'm taking it a little bit out of context because what that scripture had to do was with Jesus Christ coming back. We don't know the day, the hour, the minute when Jesus is coming back. Well, that's a whole other sermon in itself, but that's telling us we better get ready because at any moment we wanna have our lives right with Christ, be right with Christ, living in Christ, because he may come back, or he may come for you. A death in Christ can be a beautiful thing. It is a beautiful thing because you're going home. We have to start looking at death for the Christian as a, as a positive thing. Even though we have pain and it hurts that they went home, it's still a good thing in Christ because that's what we're actually trying to do this morning. We're here, if you're here this morning in church, you're looking for something else. You're looking for a hope and assurance. And that hope and assurance is in the cross of Jesus Christ. That's why we're here, to find healing in Jesus. I want to read some scripture to you out of uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Boy, I knew whatever idea it was to keep a pair of glasses up here. I really appreciate that. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. It says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Therefore, gird up your loins. What's it, what's it mean when it says to gird up your loins? It means to tighten up your belt. Back then, they wore what they called Tunics, or it's a long robe. It would almost look like a man was wearing a dress today if he wore it. 
But whenever they went to do hard labor or they went to battle, they pulled their tunic up and they tied it in a knot or they put a belt around it and it looked like they had shorts on. God's saying that we need to tighten up our belt. We need to tighten up the way that we think. And then it says to be sober-minded. You're going to look in Scripture, and a lot of times you find that word, be sober-minded. It doesn't mean anything to do with alcohol. It doesn't mean being drunk. The meaning of sober-minded is to be free of intoxicating influences. Don't allow your mind to be drugged down by false negatives and sin and influences that the enemy brings in. Be sober-minded. Be free of intoxicating influences. That's what that means. Don't let your mind be under control of a dangerous outside force. Did you hear what I said, church? Don't let your mind be out of control. Because there is a dangerous outside force trying to get into your mind. How, how often do, does the enemy try to get into your mind? He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He's working at it every second. If he can get something in there, then it goes to your heart. And then he's got a hold on you. And that's where the freedom in Christ come into play. It'll you know, set you free this fall. But in the meantime, we got to run the race of our mind and start changing the way we think. Start, start changing what we watch. Start changing what we listen to because your ears and your mind are taking all these words and all these things in that are being spoken over you. When I heard Pastor Dave one time, he said, Troy Carey, be careful who you allow to pray over you. What do you mean by that? Be careful about what a person is speaking over you. Do, you. do they fully know Jesus Christ or are they a false religion and they're laying hands on you and speaking junk over you? Be careful who you allow to pray over you. Does that make sense, church? Amen. Make sure that the person that's praying over you has a deep, committed relationship with Jesus Christ. Make sure that person is filled with Scripture. Turn over with me to first, first Peter chapter five, starting with first five. First Peter chapter five, starting with verse five. It says, "Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed in humility. God resists the proud, but gives grace to who? He gives grace to the humble." God has another gift for you. And just like last week, it's grace. He gives grace to the humble. Verse 6. Therefore, now what's that there for? It's wanting you to look back and show it. Because God gives you grace. And he resists the proud. He says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Can you just see God's hand? Is over the earth. And all who are in it, his hand is over it. And he's resisting the proud, saying, stand back from me. But those of you that are humble, come on in. I can work with you when you're humble. I can't work with you when I'm proud. But pride comes before a fall, Scripture says. Verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Did you hear that, church? He cares for you. He doesn't just care for Troy because Troy stands up here. He cares for the people, you. Number eight, here's that word again. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. A roaring lion. I want you to get the, the word picture. Yeah, Jesus is all, always referred to as the Lion of Judah, but we're looking at a, a predator here, a different lion. When you've seen a cat lay in the woods, or think of a lion laying in the forest in the woods under the brush. It's just laying there waiting for prey to come by to pounce for the next meal. It's, it's ready to ruin life. 
That's what the enemy does. He hides in the thicket in the bush where you, you can't see him. And when an ungodly thought comes into your mind, he pounces. He leaps and he makes that thought become bigger. The enemy is all, always all ready to kill, steal, and destroy. You've got to change the way you act and think and speak to control your mind. We must focus on the mind of Christ. We must seek after that with all we've got. Verse 9. Resist him. Steadfast in faith. Knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in all the world. Verse 10. But may the God of all grace who has called to us eternal glory by Jesus Christ after you have suffered a while. Perfect, established, strengthened, and settled you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. So verse 9, Jesus says to go and resist him. Stay strong in the faith. Knowing that other people in the world are, are suffering the same experience as you have. So it's not some crazy experience that you're having that no one else has had. We're all walking through it together in faith that God is going to put an end to it. In verse 10 again, but may the God of all grace who is called to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. He says, after you have suffered a while. It doesn't say that, that Mark and Troy are going to be here on the earth and Steve and we're not going to suffer anything, does it guys? It just says after you have suffered a while. God's using that to refine you. You can let your trial and your pain and your hurt drag you deeper into depression and anxiety, or you can let it turn the other way, turn the tide, let it build you up and make you stronger. Let it make you a vessel that's going to sail deeper into the ocean miles and miles away because you're strong. Guys, when the winds in your mind start blowing every direction, you you got to learn to calm the sea. You got to learn to take a deep breath and say, Lord, you said to resist the enemy. You said that you would, you would humble me if I wasn't prideful. Guys, the enemy places so many things in this world to destroy your mind. He, he, he places sicknesses in your mind that you don't even have. Start speaking health over your body. Speak it out loud. I'm healthy today. I feel great today. When I get up out of bed, I'm not tired. I slept well, God. You, even though I only slept three hours, God, you said that was enough. Just, just walk around saying those things. Yeah, I remember a story. I, got, I don't have all the, the details, but I know that Joel and Steve's mom was really sick one time. She wasn't supposed to make it, but she said every day she went out to the mailbox and as she was walking, she spoke health over her life. That I'm going to live, that I'm not going to die, that, that I know by his stripes I'm healed, and I know, God, that you have a better plan for me. She's constantly speaking positive. Well, I tell you what, dog on the enemy can't use that, can he? Is there anything in that sentence that he can use? But if you get up in the morning and say, oh, man, I'm so tired. The enemy's like, I heard it, and I'm going to start plaguing him with all these thoughts about being tired. That's how the enemy works. Or man, I can't believe what that guy did to me. And he goes, oh God, I heard it. There's a nugget right there. Now all day long when he's at his desk, I'm going to keep bringing up that little instance that that guy did to him. Or, or my son would never be a good second baseman. He missed that ground ball and he was right there in his mid. He overthrew first base. And he's like, I got it. Did you hear what his dad said about his son? I'm going to ruin his son's mind today because of what his dad said. Parents, choose your words wisely over your children. Build them up. And if they miss a grounder, get right at them and throw them half first base and just tell them they'll get it next time with great effort. And show them how to do it. Far too long have we been dads that don't show our sons how to do it. We don't show them that they need to set their alarm clock and get up in the morning and pray. We don't show them that how to open the scripture and read it. We don't show them how to catch a baseball anymore because we're too busy. Come on, grandpas. Come on, dads. Every boy 
needs a mitt and a baseball. We've lost the American pastime through busyness of work. Guys, God gave us a wife and children to spend time with them. He made us grandparents to spend time with them. He gave us a church so we could spend time together. We got to quit giving ground to the enemy. We, we got to quit letting him run with thoughts and things in our life that he should never have a hold on us for. Titus chapter 2, starting with verse 6. Turn over with me to Titus chapter 2, starting with verse 6. Likewise, exhort the young men to be, what's that word again? Sober-minded. In all the things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works and doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. We were just talking about that. Watch our speech so the enemy can't condemn us by it. That one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things. Not answering back. That was verse 9. I know Ryan didn't have that. You guys, in verse 8, it talks about having sound speech. I was just talking about that. The Lord was talking about that. And the enemy wants to condemn us through the words that we're choosing to say. Verse 7, in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. We all go to work and we follow a certain pattern. If we're sowing, we're following a pattern. God's saying, Paul's saying, time to say, follow the pattern of good works. Do what's right in the sight of the Lord. Sober-minded. Don't let intoxicated influences continue to well, dwell on your mind. And I was blessed this week. Uh, Eric had sent me an email about Jim Ryan getting the Medal of Freedom from President Trump. Of course, being a long distance runner, I'm a huge fan of Jim Ryan. And but there was something I didn't realize to the extent about Jim Ryan. He is such a godly and Christian man. He went from being America's greatest distance runner to a congressman. But when his children got up to speak, President Trump opened a pulpit to his daughter and his son. And they spoke about how their dad was godly. Through everything that they did, he passed down a godly way of life to his children. And... Before his daughter stopped talking, the last thing she said was that she turned to President Trump and she said, Mr. President, I just want to recite this scripture for you out of Numbers. May the Lord bless and keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you peace. Don't go That's one of the first times that this country has blessed that man with scripture on TV, face to face, instead of beating the living the heck out of him. And you could just see his face. He was humbled. He was thankful. He smiled. He's done more for the church than any president we've ever had. It's time to start praying for him. It's time that we're like Jim Ryan's daughter and speak scripture over him. If you truly want the world to change and be a godly place, then we got to pray for our leaders. we got to pray for the person who's protecting us. Let me tell you something. God didn't put a preacher in the White House. He didn't put a pastor in the White House. He didn't put a missionary in the White House. He put a protector. Start seeing our president as the one who's there to protect and speak scripture over him. Search your heart, August 4th, in these upcoming elections. I told you I wasn't going to be quiet. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but I'm going to tell you to vote for Jesus Christ. If they say 
pro-choice, don't vote for them if you believe in Jesus Christ. If you're a part of Jesus Christ that says pro-choice, you shouldn't be voting for them. That blood is on your hands if you do. They got to be pro-life. They got to be pro-God. They got to be about building up. That's who the church needs to vote for. Men after God's own heart. Women after God's own heart. Getting back to Jim Ryan. <laughs> President Trump was laughing because when he introduced him, one of the things that Jim Ryan, before he became this famous runner, he got cut from the church baseball team. President Trump goes, man, that must have been a bad day. You know, but, but Jim laid in his bed at night when he was a young kid, and he said, oh, Lord, what do you want me to do? Man, if I'm not a baseball player, I, I sure would like to do something in sports, Lord. Use me and, and allow me to do something in sports. That simple prayer was answered through one of the greatest distance runners America will ever know. Do you know how he became the greatest distance runner that America will ever know? Do you know how any distance runner has success? There's one, well, there's a couple key ingredients, but there's one major, major, major key ingredient to a long distance runner. Does anybody know what that is, Mark? I'm sorry, I put him on the spot. He knows it. It's controlling your mind. It's the power to control your mind. If you can't do that, you'll never step on a cross-country course or a distance race and track. It's controlling the mind. And the enemy loves to throw all these things at you. And this is an example of how life is. Let, 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 let's just start at a five-mile race. Here's what happened to me. Here's what happens to Jim. You're running along in the race before it starts. You're all excited. Your adrenaline's flowing, and you're like, yeah, this is going to be great. I'm going to win today. And you start building your mind up. You start thinking positive, like, yeah, there's nobody here that I can't beat. But then reality hits, and the gun goes off. And all of a sudden, in that first several hundred yards, probably that first quarter, you're out of breath, and you can't breathe. And so right away, you're telling yourself, oh man, I can't breathe. I gotta catch my breath. And your mind starts to kick in. And when you start thinking about not being able to breathe and not catching your breath, everybody else starts to go by you. You're looking for that second wind to come right away where you can settle in and find a, a, a decent pace. During the course of the race, your mind, and, and this probably isn't even the enemy, but, but at some point, in real life, sometimes we just constantly think of things on our own that we shouldn't be thinking about that are negative. And then the enemy adds to it. But then you're like, oh man, my side hurts. Oh, I got a side ache. Oh man, are you, are you telling me we're only half done with the race and I got another half to go? All these thoughts keep running through your head and then you're, you're just fighting them. And then, and then you look over to the guy beside you and he's smiling at you. You're like, shut up. All these things keep attacking your mind. But then you start to say, you know what? I'm half done and the best half of, of my life, the best half of this race is yet to happen. Hey, you know what? I caught my second win and I'm still with these guys. You know what? We just crossed that section and that's the fastest half mile we've ever done. And you start thinking of all these things. And then you look down and you see the guy beside his shoes untied and you start going, man, I hope he trips on that and rolls and three other guys fall with him. You start thinking of all these things that are positive in your mind that might go your way. It's true. I had a race one time where we were in a relay and we weren't the fastest team out there on this relay. We were, I was actually a long distance runner running 100 meters because they didn't have nobody else to do it at that time. But the team that was beside us and we were at the lead meet was really fast, but he dropped the baton and it landed in my lane and bounced and I kicked it in stride clear across the track. <laughs> Guess what? We won. <laughs> Sometimes things go your way. But as a distance runner, 
where you're looking for all these things to build your mind to get the advantage. And that, that hurts, and I'll never be able to finish, and I can't do it. Start to leave your mind when you start to think positive things. When I used to get up early in the morning before college, and it was about seven miles into town, and I'd get up early, I'd set my alarm clock, and I'd run in and wake Carrie up by her bedside. She was all I was thinking about while I was running that seven miles, and that made it easy. But do you see what God's doing in life? He wants you to think on Him. He wants you to think on heavenly thoughts. And when the, the pain comes in and the hurt comes in, God, God's saying, take every thought captive and change your mind. Don't let it run wild. Don't let it get away from you or you won't finish the race. I'm here to tell you today that everybody can finish the race that God has set aside for them. Don't think outside of God. Don't think outside of God. Don't allow your eyes to take in things that you shouldn't take in, men. And then the enemy just builds junk in your head. Control your mind. Control what you're doing. I know Ken has to control his mind because that cross he carries on his shoulder to resemble Jesus Christ gets heavy, doesn't it, Ken? And it gets hot. But he's constantly thinking about, I can make a difference in people's lives. And I will remind them that, that the cross still stands, that God is faithful. Our God is faithful if you'll just allow him to have control of your mind. I mentioned it last week that George Myers has a book, Battlefield of the Mind. I would get that if I were you. It's powerful. It teaches you a new way of thinking. Speak positive words over your children. Speak positive words in your life. Speak healing in your life. Good things are going to happen. If you're looking for a job today, God's got one for you. When things don't seem to be going right at work, God's got a better place for you to be. Surround yourself with people who know Jesus Christ. Jim Ryan didn't quit. I used to tell Carrie, boy, I thought I was something in college because we'd run 70 miles a week. In that video, Jim Ryan said he ran 100, and I said, oh, my. Somebody's always doing what they should be doing. Somebody's always doing more. The bar should be set up here and not down here for the church. There's more miles to run. But the church has got to get control of their mind. The church has got to get on God's terms and not live in the flesh, but live in the spirit. In Philippians, and I want to end with some of this. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, Whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is any praiseworthy, meditate on these things. That's a scripture right there that you should take Philippians 4, 8 and write it on a little 3 by 5 note card and keep it in your wallet, your pocket, your purse, and read it. It says to, to meditate on these things, whatever's praiseworthy, whatever's true. Anything the enemy tells you is untrue, but everything in Scripture is true. What Jesus has to do in your life is true. Whatever things are pure, white as snow, focus on that. Don't beat your daughter down thinking about yourself and how bad you have it. If the enemy can bury you so low that you can't get up in the mornings. He's got you. Don't allow him to hold your chin down. Raise yourself up and think on the things that are lovely. Speak the things out that are lovely. Jesus Christ was lovely when he came to die on the cross. 
Jesus Christ was lovely when he walked the earth. Jesus Christ was lovely when he fed the 5,000, which was about 20,000. Jesus Christ was lovely in the way he taught and spoke. Whatever is lovely. The church should be a lovely place for families to come and enjoy time together. Fellowship should be lovely. Focus on those things. Focus on the good people at work. Don't focus on the one person at work that drives you insane. Focus on the ones who are speaking great things over you. Focus on what's lovely. You know what's lovely? When the stone was rolled away, Jesus Christ come out white as snow and the angels were singing. Let's pray. Worship team, come forward. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the church. The church that is the hands and feet and that reaches out and shows kindness and lovely and purity and praiseworthy to you, Father, and to those around us. And so, Father, I pray today that, that you would help us change our attitude, change our thought pattern, help us to be sober-minded. Help us not let intoxicating influences come into our mind. Help us change the pattern, the way that we think, the renewing of our mind, Romans 12, 2 says, that we can test and approve what your good and perfect will is, Father. And I know today that if you're watching, Jesus Christ loves you. I know that he wants to come into your heart and into your life. I know that in your living room today, he's wanting to heal you. Ask him. Believe it. Jesus Christ has you right where you're at. Amen.
folks that run the race fight the good fight. Whatever phrase word you meditate on that. God's breath is in your lungs. If you've allowed him to live in you, if you allow him to grow in you, his very hand wants to reach out and touch you today. Now I want everybody to close your eyes for a moment and just think on what's good and what's right and what's pure. Thank God for something that he did in your life. It doesn't matter if it was yesterday, last week, three years ago, five years ago. Thank God, first of all, for his son, Jesus Christ. And then thank you for something else that he did in your life. If you're hurting today, if, if you don't feel well about something today in your soul, your spirit, your physical body, no one's watching. I just want you to raise your hand. Raise your hand. And I just pray that that the God of this world, that Jesus Christ's spirit would touch you and that he would be over you and that whatever you're dealing with, that he would bring healing over your life today, your mind, your body, your soul, your spirit. The Bible says that if we knock, the door will be open. If we see, the reply will ask, it will be given. 